Today, my associate speaker, Sean Boonstra, will present an inspiring It Is Written presentation. You'll appreciate Sean's depth of Bible knowledge, his genuine sincerity, and his ability to make profound Bible truths easy to understand. For the last five years, Sean has inspired It Is Written television audiences throughout Canada. And now, Pastor Sean Boonstra. A lot of people's Christian experience is like a wild roller coaster ride. One day they feel as if the angels themselves are walking next to them and the courts of heaven are smiling on everything they do. But sometimes the very next day they feel as if God is a million miles away and they're not even sure if the courts of heaven can remember their name. It's a dangerous approach to Christianity and it's one that can be stopped. Stay tuned to find out how. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. Presented by Sean Boonstra. Dirty dishes and whitewashed tombs. It was time for the annual physical at the all-boys private school, and nervous seventh graders dressed in white hospital gowns were lined up outside the doctor's office waiting for their turn. As you might expect from a group of 12-year-old boys, they started to tease each other and tell stories about how awful the examination was going to be. Billy, said one boy, you don't want to go in there. They say the nurse is a real butcher. My older brother had to do this same exam last year, and he says they had to give him the same needle seven times because they couldn't find a vein. And then to make matters worse, they broke the needle off right in his arm. All the boys laughed because they knew it was just a story. But young Joseph wasn't laughing because out of all of the boys standing in line, he was pretty sure the physical really was going to be awful. You see, when he was only four years old, he had an accident. He was out tobogganing with his family when he hit a tree and hurt his back. And while most four-year-olds would recover from something like that very quickly, Joseph's back hurt for a very long time. So long, in fact, that his parents took him to see a doctor. The doctor was very concerned. That back shouldn't still hurt like that, he said. I think we better get some x-rays just in case. The x-rays revealed some terrible news. Tuberculosis of the spine and little Joseph had to undergo a series of painful surgeries and literally spent years strapped to a canvas bed. When it was all over, he went back to school wearing a big metal brace over the hump in his spine. When he had all his clothes on, you couldn't really see the disfigurement, but at the seventh grade physical, he was going to have to drop his disguise in front of the doctor, and the hump on his spine was going to stand out. It was the most awful day of the year for him. He lived in terror of having the school doctor find out what he really looked like. Now follow me carefully. When Joseph had his disguise on and you couldn't see the disfigurement in his back, he felt pretty good. He felt like an accepted part of the community, as long as somebody didn't strip away his disguise and reveal his deformity. And that's exactly how a lot of people live out their Christian experience. They live in terror of having somebody find out what they're really like when nobody's looking. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian who lost his life for the Christian faith, wrote this. He who is alone with his sin is utterly alone. It may be that Christians, notwithstanding corporate worship, common prayer, and all their fellowship and service, may still be left to their loneliness. The final breakthrough does not occur because though they have fellowship with one another as believers and devout people, they do not have fellowship as the undevout, as sinners. The pious fellowship permits no one to be a sinner. So everyone must conceal his sin from himself and from the fellowship. We dare not be sinners. Many Christians are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is suddenly discovered among the righteous. So we remain alone with our sin, living in lies and hypocrisy. The fact is that we are sinners. And that much the Bible agrees with. Romans 3 verse 23 says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. John wrote in 1 John 1 verse 8 that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. A couple of verses later in verse 10 he says, 
If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Why do we make God a liar if we say we haven't sinned? Because he says in his word that we have. There's not a human being alive who hasn't sinned. But interestingly, even though we know we've all sinned, we still live in sheer terror of having somebody find out. So we learn what kinds of things to say and what kinds of things to do so that nobody would ever suspect at church that we've got something hidden under our hospital gown. We shudder at the thought of having somebody find out what we're really like when nobody's looking. A young mother was preparing dinner for company and everything was going wrong. Twice she had to run to the store for ingredients she forgot, and while she was gone, the cake in the oven burned. It was a long day, but finally, just as the guests arrived, dinner was ready, and it looked pretty good. And as she sat at the table and looked at everybody, she began to feel just a little bit proud. She turned to her little girl and said, Debbie, would you please ask the blessing tonight? But Mommy, she said, I wouldn't know what to say. Well, why don't you just say what Mommy says, honey? Okay, and she bowed her head and closed her eyes and folded her little hands and started to pray. Dear Lord, she said, what in the world was I thinking when I invited all those people over for dinner? A lot of people, even church-going Christians, live in fear of having somebody find out what they're really like. The last thing we want is for somebody at church to find out that we're a sinner. And so week after week, we do the things that church people are supposed to do, and we say the things that church people are supposed to say, but still we live in fear that somebody is going to find out that we're not perfect. Now, I'm not suggesting that Christians should advertise their mistakes or that we should be dwelling on our sins because a forgiven sin is a forgotten sin. But we need to be able to admit to ourselves that we're sinners. If we can't do that, we run the risk of falling into the trap of legalism. We start to think that if we're just good enough, God will accept us and hold us close. And then on the days when we make a mistake or do something that God would never approve of, we assume that God doesn't want us anymore and He pushes us away. And our Christian experience becomes a wild roller coaster ride. Even though nobody else might know how we feel, we're up one day and down the next. One day we're on the path to glory, and on the next we're not sure where we stand. One day we're hiding comfortably under our disguise, but the next we find ourselves standing in line at the doctor's office, terrified, because we know the truth is about to come out. So sometimes we try to solve the problem by directing attention away from ourselves. We like to point out how awful someone else's deformities look, hoping that if somebody else has something worse, we won't seem so bad. We walk around carrying a clipboard on our belt, keeping careful track of our sins and our victories. And if our list doesn't look too bad compared to someone else's, we feel pretty good. But then on those days when our list looks kind of shady compared to other people, we try to make it disappear until it's safe to bring it back out. And that approach to living the Christian life is a formula for becoming a Pharisee. You'll notice that while Jesus was here on earth, he seemed to have an easier time getting along with prostitutes and thieves than some of the established religious authorities of the day. He chose to eat dinner in the house of Zacchaeus, a ruthless tax collector who had been stealing from people. He went out of his way to befriend a woman who had been married five times and now was shacked up with somebody. The first person he appeared to after his resurrection was Mary Magdalene, a woman who had been possessed by demons. He almost seemed to prefer the company of people with questionable character. Because he condoned their lifestyles? Not at all. It was because those kinds of people were irresistibly attracted to him. They had nothing to lose and nothing to hide. Jesus' biggest audience was precisely those people you'd never expect to find sitting at his feet. But that very fact disturbed the Pharisees who did not want to sit at Jesus' feet. Luke 15 and verse 2 says, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eats with them. The Pharisees were a proud group of nationalists who were very good at living out an external godly life. And to emphasize how well they were doing, they categorized the people who were struggling with obvious sins as unworthy of Jesus' attention. 
It's the same kind of problem you might find in some Christian churches today. We tend to point out other people's faults in a desperate effort to cover up our own. I've met many Christians who are vigilant, even vitriolic in their attempts to root out sinners from the church, but it often turns out that those same people are doing much worse things than the people they condemn. Paul wrote this in his letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 2 and verse 1, where the Bible says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest does the same things. Paul's not saying that Christians shouldn't judge at all. Jesus was clear that we should determine people's character and their influence on our lives by the fruit they bear. And the Bible is also clear that we should test every spirit by the Word of God. It's not judging in and of itself that's out of bounds. It's judging the way the Pharisees did it. And that's essentially the context of Romans chapter 2. The Pharisees made a point out of exhibiting other people's faults in an attempt to cover up their own. What Jesus was doing didn't make sense to a Pharisee. In their way of thinking, to eat with sinners is to be just like them. And that didn't agree with their clipboard version of righteousness. In their hearts, I believe they were afraid of finding out that they really weren't much better than the sinners Jesus ate with. Or even more likely, they were afraid of having other people find out that they were cut from the same bolt of cloth as the shady bunch of characters at Jesus' dinner table. They were afraid of admitting that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, including them. But the fact is that until you can admit that there's something fundamentally wrong with your spiritual condition, you will never find the sense of peace you're looking for. As long as you rely on your disguise for righteousness, God can't do a thing to help you. He doesn't work by the clipboard method. He doesn't give you salvation credit for your good deeds and then build on them. Notice what Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew, the ninth chapter in the twelfth verse, where the Bible says, But when Jesus heard that, that's their murmuring about the publicans and sinners, He said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Now, was Jesus saying that the Pharisees didn't need Him? Not at all. He was saying that the publicans and sinners realized that they were sick and admitted it, so He was able to help them. But the Pharisees, who would not admit for a moment that they had any spiritual flaws, couldn't be helped. Because in order for you to build a relationship with God, it's got to be based on honesty. And anybody who cannot admit that they are a sinner is not being honest. And God won't force you against your will to admit it. The Pharisees were good at all of the external aspects of religion. They understood all of the sacrifices and ceremonies, but they didn't understand love and mercy because they had never allowed themselves to experience it. They went through the motions of a godly religion without understanding the substance of it. And that's why Jesus compared the Pharisees to dirty dishes and whitewashed tombs in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, in verse 25, where Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like unto whited sepulchres, or tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Take a walk through a graveyard sometime. And you'll have to admit that some of the tombstones are beautiful. But look past the fancy calligraphy and the elegantly carved granite, and what will you find? You'll find the truth about graveyards. They're full of the stench of death and decay. And God says that when we try to cover up our sins instead of just being honest with Him, we're not fooling anybody. We're just like those tombstones. We look beautiful on the outside, but inside we stink. We might live in fear of having other Christians find out what we're really like, but we don't have to worry when it comes to God 
because he already knows what we're like and he loves us anyway. Jesus didn't come to call righteous people to a new life. He came to call sinners. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 5 verse 8 that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. One of the biggest challenges Christians face is to shake their clipboard concept of righteousness and realize that God's not going to accept you on the basis of what you can do for Him. He accepts you because He loves you. He died for you, not after you proved yourself, but while you were still a sinner. You just can't earn your way into God's favor. The only way He can take you back is to forgive you, and that's your only option. Does that mean that the things you do and the things you say don't matter? Of course not. The Bible is clear that a relationship with Jesus will change your life. The Apostle John, for example, wrote in 1 John 2 verse 4, He that says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. The Bible says in the 19th chapter of Luke that when Zacchaeus met Jesus, he had a change of heart, and he promised to pay back everything he had stolen four times over. Why? because he was trying to demonstrate to God that he was worth saving? No. He was doing those things because the inside of the tomb had been cleaned out, and now the outside was really clean. Right actions matter to God, but so do right motives, and you will never have right motives until you can admit to God that you don't have any. I used to restore damaged carpets, and sometimes I was called when a family pet had an accident on the rug. I had two choices to deal with that accident, I could spray a deodorizer over it and cover up the smell, but that never lasted. Some homeowners actually couldn't admit that their pet had sprayed on the carpet and they wouldn't let me clean up. They just wanted me to make it smell good. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did. They covered up the bad smell with deodorizers. But folks, a skunk wearing perfume is still a skunk. The other and wiser choice is to clean up the mess and get rid of the smell. And that's what Zacchaeus did. He smelled good, not because he covered up the stench of sin, but because he was honest enough to go to Jesus and deal with the problem. He got off that roller coaster of feeling good on days that he behaved and feeling as if God didn't have any use for him on days that he didn't. He realized that salvation is not based on feeling as if you're saved. It's based on knowing it. It's based on knowing that in spite of who you are, Jesus still wants you. 1 John 5 verse 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. The Bible doesn't talk about feeling like God accepts us. It talks about that incredible moment when we can come clean with God and admit that we're in trouble. And from that point on, you don't worry about feeling saved. You know it's true because God promises it. When you're honest with God, He gets to the root of the problem and He sorts it out. You don't have to. Joseph finally got inside the doctor's office. The doctor said, all right, Joseph, let's get on with it. Hop up on the scale. Joseph got up on the scale. The doctor moved the little steel weights around and then made some notes on his clipboard. And then came that awful moment that Joseph dreaded. Okay, Joseph, said the doctor. You can take the robe off. He reached around behind his neck, fumbled with the string, and finally managed to untie it. The robe slipped to the ground, and he pinched his eyes shut. And for a moment, he felt more naked than anybody had ever felt before. He felt just like you might feel if all your disguises were suddenly ripped away and you found yourself standing in the presence of God himself. He felt weak vulnerable, exposed. It was an awful feeling. And then suddenly the doctor put down his chart and put one hand on either side of his face and looked deep into his eyes. Joseph, he said, do you believe in God? Well, yes, sir, I do. Good, said the doctor, because there's nothing you can do in this world without him. The more faith you have in him, the greater faith you'll have in yourself. There was something about the touch of that man's hands on his face and the intensity of his need for God that made young Joseph shiver. And then just as suddenly as it happened, it was over. The doctor let go of his face, 
picked up the chart and became very businesslike. He wrote some more things down and then he said, excuse me for a minute, I'll be right back. Walked out of the room. Joseph stood there, hoping the whole ordeal would be over soon. Then he noticed that the chart was still sitting on the desk. He wondered what it said. It was more than he could resist. He walked over and picked it up, bracing himself for the ugly truth. But there on the paper, beside the words physical characteristics, there were just a few words written. Joseph has an unusually well-shaped head. There was nothing there about the deformity in his spine, nothing at all. It was almost as if the doctor didn't even see it. And when you come to God with all of your sins and deformities, and you have the courage to drop your disguise, and you're honest with God that you need His help, you're going to find that God hardly notices your deformities anymore. In fact, all He sees is the righteousness of His Son, and He gives that to you as a gift. And you will know at that moment that He wants you. There will be no more roller coaster rides in your spiritual life. You will rest in the assurance that you've been forgiven. And when you look in the books of judgment one day, you're going to see that there's no mention of your problems. There's only mention of the solution, the righteousness and blood of Christ. And after all, that's the only real righteousness there is. Lord, I come to you, let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I've found in you. And Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see.
Sadly, that's all the time that we've got for this week. Plan to join us again next week as once again we look at the Word of God together. And remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. <laughs>